Hi, everyone, and welcome back to The Road to Financial Freedom, a podcast that allows experts to share their stories and secrets to unlocking their financial independence. This podcast is brought to you by Camaplan, a self-directed IRA administrator in Ambler, Pennsylvania, that is focused on educating investors with different ways to grow their retirement savings faster through alternative investments. And today we are recording this podcast episode again remotely. I'm Jess Jones, a Camaplan team member and podcast host. This week, we're going to take another in-depth look at a tool for unlocking financial freedom, the self-directed IRA itself. Most income earners in the country aren't aware of the self-directed option for several reasons. Brokers and custodians don't always fully understand or even offer self-direction, and even if they do, it's often from a limited menu of investment options or it creates a conflict of interest with what they're offering. Sometimes professional advisors, financial planners, and accountants aren't even familiar with self-direction themselves. Now more than ever, there is an urgency to saving your money and taking control of your investments is one step that you can take to help navigate that sea of uncertainty. And that's why we're joined today by Will Mucker. He is a member of the Camaplan team and is a client executive as well as a licensed realtor. He has educated many of our clients about self-directed IRAs, what they do and their benefits on their financial futures at all stages of the investment processes. Today, Will is going to break down some of the frequently asked questions surrounding self-directed IRAs. So thanks for joining us, Will. Thanks for having me. I'm honored to be on here. Yeah. Fun fact, Will and I went to high school together. I just had to put that out there. (laughs) So it's a small world brought us back. (laughs) So the reason why I actually do bring that up, Will, is because, you know, you and I are the same age where sort of beginning stages of, you know, figuring out, you know, our own roads to financial freedom. But for whatever reasons, one way or another, we end up here at Cama Plan and we're trying to educate younger people too on what self-directed IRAs are and, you know, how they can benefit people starting out earlier rather than waiting to start out later for retirement. So like when we went to the, our local high school, things like that to educate our to educate younger people on how to start, you know, taking control of their money. So I guess like the the first question we can start with is what is a self-directed IRA? So when your friends ask you, you know, what do you do? What is it that your company offers? What do you what's the best way that you can break it down and explain to them? Yeah, absolutely. So the best way to go about it is if you want to understand what a self-directed IRA is, you need first need to know what an IRA itself is. A lot of people that, you know, we've grown up with or our generation you know, we weren't provided this information or it wasn't just super evident to us by, you know, the courses we took or, you know, whatever educational avenues we took. But an IRA is basically you can take your earned income and you can put it in in this tax sheltered vehicle where, you know, it's either tax deferred or post tax. So you either pay your taxes up front or on the back end. So rather than paying all of your taxes to Uncle Sam at the end of every year or at the end of every month with every paycheck, you can actually put that money away and use it and grow it. And most people do it on the stock market. But that's where self-directed IRAs come in because you don't have to have your tax sheltered retirement savings tied to Wall Street and all these companies where you don't have any say or any control over what happens. And the beauty of a self-directed IRA is it incorporates alternative investments. So rather than stocks, bonds and ETFs, You can go out and you can lend money. You can turn your IRA into a mini bank and demand principal and interest payments back just like your college loans. Or you can go out and purchase physical real estate, invest into small companies that are just starting up that may not be publicly traded. And there's just a wide variety of different options as compared to just the stock market where, again, you have no control over it. Right. So besides the major difference that, you know, a regular IRA is subject and tied to Wall Street and a self-directed IRA allows you to kind of be behind the wheel with things, is there any other way that a self-directed IRA works differently from a regular IRA or is that the major difference? Those are the main things that differ from uh, an ordinary IRA. People come in when they want to open an account and they're looking for you know, where's a self-directed IRA option on the application? It's the same IRAs. Self-directed is just an adjective. Again, it means you're not investing on the Wall Street. You're using alternative investments. So it's traditional IRAs, SEP IRAs, Roth IRAs, simple IRAs, all that good stuff. All the same rules apply, contributions, distributions, prohibited transactions, and all that good stuff. It's just the investments that change. Cool. All right. Thanks. Um, So How does any retirement account, not even just self-directed IRAs, differ from like a savings or a checking account? So and how do they differ from any 
passive income avenues? Mainly it's the taxes. So with your you know normal savings accounts and checking accounts, you've already paid the taxes on that income and you're using it. And the income you earn from that, whether it be interest, dividends, whatever it is, that's taxed too. But when you put your money into an IRA, whether it be a pre-tax IRA or a post-tax IRA like a Roth, the earnings inside of that are tax-free. You don't pay taxes. You don't have to you know, pay Uncle Sam to help keep the lights on. So it's on the, the principle of compound interest. It helps you grow that savings balance a lot faster than these other methods. Yeah, so definitely I'm I'm thinking of would it be right to say then, you know, putting some of your money into one of these vehicles like a self-directed IRA or just a, even an IRA in general now for myself at 25 would be better than holding on to all the income I'm even making, you know, stuff that's being taxed in terms of my W2 and things like that, but even just like putting it in a savings account, it's not really going anywhere growing versus if I put it in one of these accounts, right? Exactly. So the soonest you can get started, the better. So all you have to have is earned income. And again, on the principle of compound interest, the longer you put your money in there, the greater the snowball effect is going to be. I've already started Roth IRAs for my nieces and nephews because I'm honored to have learned this information when I did or when we did at such a young age. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like beating myself over the head because I didn't get started sooner. Right, exactly. And so your nieces and nephews are young, right? They're like all under three. <laughs> they're they're very young. Yeah. So yeah, my niece didn't even turn a year yet. She's like four months. Yeah, old. exactly. So the uh, <laughs> how does that work then? If they, how are you able to make that structure work so that you know people, young kids can get started, parents can start their their kids out, or uncles can start their nieces and nephews out, even if they don't, you know, a four month old isn't going to have earned income. But how does that work? How are they able to do that? Great question. So the big thing is they do have to have earned income. So in order to contribute to an IRA, it has to be earned income. So I'm not a tax professional to start off with. So if anybody wants to research this, definitely talk to your tax professional. But the way to do it is I have an LLC. So what I do is I hire my nieces and nephews as, you know, models and, you know, they might wear a shirt for me or a hat or something like that. And I'll have my sisters take pictures of them and I'll post it on an Instagram page or something like that or my catalog and I'll invoice them for their their time as a, a child model for the business. And that way mm -hmm. they can take that earned income, put it into a checking account and then immediately deposit that into a retirement account. That's awesome. That's good. You're a good uncle. I wish I was a child model for Will Mucker. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> would be, I would be in a much better financial position than I am currently. <laughs> Family first, you know? Exactly, exactly. F friends from high school and later work second. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> You're on the list. Thank you, Will. <laughs> so <laughs> why start this now, I guess? Like, why is it better to start out early? You've touched on this a little bit already, but why start doing this now? And why do this while the government is already taking out for things like Social Security, Medicare, and federal and state taxes? So two-part question then. Why start early and why do it now when you're already, you know, having tax cuts being made to your income? Um, another great question. So Everybody says, you know, wait till you're ready for anything. This applies to anything in life. They're like, wait till you're ready, you know, take notes. But I think the best way to do it is actually to get your, your you know, your, your hands dirty and get in there, learn the ropes, learn, you know, exactly what's a good investment, what's not the best investment, make your mistakes now and be able to earn that compound interest now and grow that principal balance. So by the time you're ready to retire, you're not rushing around trying to get 15, 20 percent all the time, you can diversify and put your money elsewhere and grow it over time and be much more comfortable. And in regards to your question about Social Security, federal and state taxes, that's your tax liability. But the great thing about these is you file your contributions at the end of the year with your taxes. So if it's in a pre-tax account, that lowers your tax liability. So if you pay taxes for something like that, that'll just increase your, your refund. So they give you back the taxes that you may have paid on that money that you already put in to the retirement account, the pre-tax account. If it's post-tax, you're already going to pay taxes on it anyway. But everything after that's tax-free. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're partial for the Roths, especially that's why I opened them for my nieces and nephews because when they take this money out, they're not going to have to take 
or pay taxes on the balance they take out because they're already going to be paying them now. Great. Thank you. And I want to touch back on compound interest and, and contributions and how they can grow over time in just a bit. But um, a couple of quick other quick questions I have just really broadly to self-directed accounts in general. So can any type of retirement account be self-directed? Um, can you talk a little bit more about, you know, we hear, you can hear self-directed 401k or self-directed educational savings account, those sorts of things. Can you just break that down a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. Again, self-directed is just an adjective. All right. federal plans, uh, as far as I'm concerned, can be self-directed. So you have your Roth, SEPs, Simples, ESAs, HSAs, traditional IRAs, solo Ks, all of them can be self-directed. It's the state plans that I'm not too sure about, and I don't think they can, like uh, 529 plans. A lot of people ask about those, those college savings plans. They can't be self-directed, uh-huh. at least not with us. But any IRA, you know, you, you go to Schwab, you open an account there. Any IRA, HSA, ESA, they can be self-directed. Cool. Thank you. And so besides having earned income, are there any other requirements that, you know, delineate when you're able to open up an IRA? I believe it's not when you can open. I mean, you have to have earned income to open up an account, but the only right. other you know factor on whether you can contribute to an account, not necessarily open it, is your income. Right. So if you uh, Roth IRAs have income restrictions that if you earn a certain amount, mm-hmm. depending on how you file, you may not be eligible to contribute anymore because you're making too much. But there's always a way to pay the taxes because Uncle Sam will take the money whenever you're saying you're you're willing to give it to them, especially if it's early. And mm-hmm. you can consult your tax professionals about uh, backdoor Roths where you just do a Roth conversion. But other than that, no, you just need to have earned income. Thank you for that. So the that helps answer a lot of, I think, the general questions that surround what this even is. I know when I explain it to my friends, having some of these answers in my back pocket is probably going to be a little bit more helpful than even my explanations are now after having been at Cama for as long as I have been. So I think that this is going to be really helpful, Will, uh, especially for, you know, those, the youngsters out there who are, and I think it's interesting too, the fact that you have said like, oh, I have an LLC. My nieces and nephews will model some of my clothing, this and that. I put it on Instagram. There is a sense of, you know, I think a lot of people, uh, younger people have, are trying to start more businesses, trying to be a little bit more entrepreneurial in the sense of, you know, you can earn income from their Instagram influencers out there. There are YouTube people who are making money, things like that. Do you know at offhand at all if that's like how, I mean, obviously the two are tied, but how, like, can, uh, could someone, could a YouTube star consider like their income from their YouTube channel as something that they can use to contribute to a, an IRA and yeah, self-direct? Yeah, absolutely. As long as you're reporting that income, whether it be and it's any form of earned income, whether it be influencer income, whether it be an LLC that you're running, whether it be your drop shipping stuff with Shopify, whatever way you earn that money, you can put that into a retirement account. You just need to be, it just needs to be earned income. That's really cool. It's a way to get your money to, you know, you're going through all the, jumping through all the hoops to create your own business and create your own brand. You might as well have that money that you're making for it work harder for you. I think it makes a ton of sense. So the next question I have, Will, does have to do with something that you brought up earlier, the contribution limits for different accounts. And and once you can contribute to your account, once you start contributing to a self-directed IRA account, there is that concept of com- compound interest and how that grows over time. Can you explain that a little bit more as if, you know, I was a high schooler myself and you were trying to explain how compound interest works and how it would benefit over yeah, time? Yeah, absolutely. So one example I like to use if is if you're earning 10%, let's just say a flat 10%, and you and three friends decide to contribute $40,000, or I think it was $50,000 over 40 years, 10% tax bracket. If you put it in a tax deferred account and a post-tax retirement account over 40 years, I believe you earn $2.2 million because you're not paying taxes on that, that money, but you'll just have to pay the taxes on that on the tax deferred account when you take it out. So it's going to dwindle down a little bit lower. But if you did it, within a taxable account, like a normal savings account or your personal checkings account, you're getting taxed on the income coming in. So you're not earning as much interest because your principal balance isn't growing as quickly. 
So if you did it out of a taxable account or in this example, over, I believe it's 40 years at a 10% interest rate, you're only going to end up with $700,000, where in these tax advantaged accounts, you're ending with $2.2 million. You just have to decide whether you want to pay the taxes now and have that $2.2 million cash, or if you don't want to pay the taxes now, and then you want to pay taxes on $2.2 million. That's, again, another reason why I'm partial to the Roths, because you know, just that example itself, $2.2 million is a pretty chunk chunk of change and I don't want to pay taxes on that. Right, exactly. So you brought this up and I'm wondering like what other differences are there between a traditional and a Roth IRA? Basically, I guess, what does the difference in income have to look like for each account? If I, you know, started investing, if I try to start investing now at age 25, I don't know if my income qualifies me for a Roth now, but could it eventually? I'm just curious about, you know, how that how that works for people, especially if they want to start out younger. Yeah. So I believe for, I don't believe there's any income restrictions with traditional IRAs. With Roth IRAs, there's a cap. There's no minimum. Yeah, as long as you're earning $1, you can contribute it. But I think it's like, again, I'm not a tax professional, but I think it's something, it, again, it depends on how you file. So if you're filing single, if you're married, filed, filing jointly or separately, it all depends. But if say we're just single filing, you know, solo, then I believe the cap seventy five thousand dollars. I don't quote me on that, but it's something around that. So that means you're not allowed to contribute directly mm-hmm. to a Roth anymore, but you can still contribute to your traditional and then convert it. And the the main difference between these two accounts, traditional and Roth, are pre tax and post tax. With traditional IRAs, they actually make you start taking mm-hmm. the money out at a certain point. I believe it's seventy two now which is called a required minimum distribution. So Uncle Sam says, hey, you didn't pay taxes on all this money for 72 years. It's time that you start taking this money out and paying us the taxes on that distribution amount. But with Roth IRAs, another advantage of Roth IRAs is Mm -hmm. you already paid your taxes. They can't tell you to take it out. You can keep it in there as long as you want. And contributions you can take out at any, any time in a Roth IRA, unlike the traditional IRAs. And then Roth IRAs also have qualified distributions of the earnings based on different life situations, like first time home buyers right. can take out earnings from their Roth IRA. People pursuing continuing education can take out money for higher education from their Roth IRAs. And, and when I say money, I mean earnings. You can always take out your contributions. So those are a lot of the difference in, differences between the traditional and Roth IRAs. And again, why I'm so partial with those Roths, especially for young people like us and and even younger, like my nieces and nephews. Right. Especially the fact that, you know, based on what you explained about compound interest, it makes a ton more sense to account for the fact that you don't know what's going to happen in the future. You don't know what could happen. I mean, there's no telling if another pandemic like this knock on wood should ever happen, what that's going to do to the economy, what that's going to do to even the political landscape to then affect the economy. So I think it makes a ton of sense to try your best to <laughs> keep avo- like to pay those taxes up front now when you know what the circumstances are surrounding your income versus just kind of leaving it up to fate. And kind of like you said before, just waiting on it. Even still, there's still you know, ways to be proactive even after you've been proactive and open these accounts. Exactly. You pay the taxes when you know what they are, because I'm always going to be on the edge where I think taxes are going to be up because it all depends on who's in office and the political climate and all that good stuff and COVID and all that. We know how quickly things can change in a way of life where it's better to, you know, prepare now and get the stuff, um, yeah. get the taxes out of the way when you know exactly what you're going to be paying. Right. So, well, what in terms of compound interest or interest on these accounts, what determines interest rates and what would be considered a good interest rate? Great question. So uh, the Fed, the I believe it's the not the Federal Reserve, but the Fed uh, determines the actual interest rate for like savings accounts and all that. And people go off of that on what's good and what's bad right now. I think you know, brokerage accounts on average earn about six to ten percent annually. Don't quote me on that. But alternative investors who, you know, are familiar with real estate or lending money, they're looking for anywhere from twelve to fifteen to even sometimes on the higher end, like twenty percent back on their principal. So I would say for a good interest rate, I'm looking anywhere between twelve and fifteen percent 
if I can get anything higher, that's just great. That's that's icing on the cake. Okay, great. And so backing up a little bit, and maybe we can touch on this some more when we break down the different types of things that you can determine as alternative investments in a self-directed IRA. I know it took me a couple of times hearing it to finally ask what the difference between a uh, principal (laughs) interest and uh, uh, what a principal interest and a, I'm blanking on what the other one is, but uh, the the difference between the two and, and what they are, the principal and the... Uh, principal and interest? Yes, yeah. Gosh, you combined them. I, I completely yeah. understand where you're coming from. Um, See, even still, so, I'm like, what is the difference? <laughs> like, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I do the same thing all the time. But principal is, for example, I lend somebody $5,000 and at a 10% interest rate. So that means I want $500 back on my 5,000, 10% of my 5,000. Mm-hmm. So the 5,000 is the principal amount. They have my 5,000. They have to give me back that principal m- amount at least. So whatever they pay back of that 5,000 is considered principal. But the 500 at the 10%, that's the interest. So um, let's say monthly payments were like, I don't know, $55 or something. I'm not going to do the math off the top of my head right now, but a certain percentage is either going to be interest and a certain percentage is going to be principal, or you can split it up where they're paying you that $500 first, quote unquote, for record keeping. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to pay you back the lump sum of the principal balance, either that $5,000, either again, in a balloon payment, or that it's going to be mixed in with those interest interest payments. And it's going to amortize or, or to kill off that uh, the interest you're earning because you're paying on a lower principal balance. So the principal determines the interest based off the interest rate. So that's the best way I can explain it. Yeah, no, I think that, that contextualizes it a lot, at least for me. I think it'll help listeners, especially hearing like, I think these big words get thrown around a lot. And we know them because we're exposed to them every day. But being able to actually sit down and break it down for someone, I think, is really helpful. So thanks for that. Yeah. And the the beautiful thing, not to cut you off, about that, that, uh, that example is once that, using the same example, once that $500 gets, $500 of interest gets paid back on your $5,000 and you have all your money back, that $5,500 is now principal for compound interest. So... Now that's your new principal. So go earn 10% on that 5,500. I'm not sure if, if I said 55,000, but 5,500. Now you can earn 10% on that, which is going to be greater interest. And that's the snowball effect of compound interest. And that's why you want to start as early as possible right. to make it things you know, full circle. Yeah, exactly. No, that's a good example in how to bring things back around. So therefore then you mentioned, you know, you can lend in your IRA. There are interest rates that are on, you know, balloon balloon payments or balloon notes. Can you go into some more about the types of things you can invest in with a self-directed IRA? And really, you know, you can, I would say if you can provide like a tangible example, like the one you just provided for kind of the major things that you can invest in in a self-directed IRA, these alternative investments, just so people can understand what you mean by, I mean, I know when I heard private lending for the first time, I was like, cool but I just didn't know what it was for a good like month until I asked somebody. So I think if you can break those things down in a really tangible example, like you have been so far, that'll be helpful for people to get an idea of what they're able to do and see if there's anything that connects to their interests. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the big four we talk about there, you can, the, the thing is with IRAs, the IRS never tells you what you can invest in only what you can't. So I've seen people invest in sheep and sell the wool. I've seen people buy fruit trees and sell the fruit. But uh, it, as long as it's not prohibited and you're not gaining any direct benefit personally from it, it's usually okay. But the big things that our clients invest in every day are real estate, where you know you go out, you find you know a nice rental property, you know one two three Main Street. You purchase it for $100,000 in the IRA and you want to set the rental income at $2,000 a month or, you know, $1,200, whatever kind of landlord you want to be based off, you know, what area it is and, you know, what renovations you've done, what kind of place and all that good stuff. And that rental income will flow back into the IRA tax free, similar to your interest and dividend payments from those stocks, bonds and ETFs. So you're basically just like you're going out and purchasing, purchasing stocks and bonds. Instead, you 
replace those stocks and bonds with a property and you replace those interest and dividend payments with a rental check. Another thing people invest in is, as we said, private lending. As you said, cool, what is it? So just like that, we take auto loans out, we take home loans out, we take you know college loans, all that, where they give us a, a certain amount of money and we have to pay interest on it based on how long it takes us to pay back and the interest rate they set it at. So now you get to flip the tables, find a, a lender, whether it be a flipper who's flipping properties, they need money, whether it be a non-disqualified person from you, like a non-lineal, ascent or decent person, so like aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, family, friends, they need money for whatever it is. If they want to buy a house, you can even secure it to the property in the forms of a mortgage, but you're basically, again, giving them a principal, al- principal balance excuse me, and demanding a, an interest rate back and you and your borrower will come to an agreement on whether you know you want to do principal and interest payments combined, if you want to do just interest up front and then do a balloon payment at the end. But you're earning interest on the money that you're giving them. So that's obviously incentive. But you guys get to d- determine whether you want to pay 10% interest, 12%, 15 if they're willing to go 20 or if you want to go as low as you know 5 or whatever it may be, whatever fits your financial goals best, just like you're going out and purchasing stocks, bonds, and ETFs, you replace the stocks, bonds, and ETFs with a note. That's the physical document that you sign and you agree to these terms and principal and interest payments flow back to the account tax-free or tax-deferred, depending on the account. And then you just rinse and repeat and you use that uh, compound interest. Another option is what's called a private placement. So instead of going out and purchasing shares of a publicly traded company on the stock market like you do in you know, your standard traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs on the stock market, you can actually purchase shares of privately traded companies. Before Amazon, Tesla, Google, and all of them went public, you couldn't invest into them on the stock market. So what you would have to do is use one of these vehicles like a private placement memorandum and buy shares of these privately traded companies where you own a certain amount of shares of the company. And based on those shares and the performance or a specific interest rate you're you're set at, you're earning interest back on these privately traded shares of this company that you invested into. And then the last major category I'll go into is precious metals. A lot of people are crazy about precious metals because there's not really record keeping with it. You don't have to determine an interest rate. The market determines the value of your gold. So you want to buy low and then that value will fluctuate and then you want to sell high. But gold will always have a value. Silver, palladium, platinum, whatever you want to do, precious metals composite. That's another big thing. But again, the IRS will never tell you what you can invest in, only what you can invest in. So you got that example with the sheep, with the wool and the the fruit trees. You can do tax liens. People do wholesaling where you go out and you get an agreement of sale for a property and somebody offers you something more. So you actually sell your rights to that agreement of sale rather than even getting involved in the property and having to go through that entire process again. So whatever works for you, whatever you're familiar with, get familiar with it now and use it in a self-directed IRA. Awesome. Thank you. This That was awesome. That just really broke things down in a very tangible way. So thanks for that. And I think it'll, you know, for me, I'm still, even still, I hear private placement and I get the explanation. I'm like, okay, cool. And I walk away from it and then I come back to it and then I hear again from you. So that actually brings me to a, another question, a couple of questions that I have for you personally. You know, you're a licensed realtor. You've gone through all that that process of everything. What are, for a lot of, for young people who are interested in, you know, becoming a realtor or for investing in real estate in their IRAs even, what are some things that, you know, what What would you recommend in terms of looking or finding the right property or pitfalls that, you know, investors in real estate should avoid or or any, I don't want to say red flags because that could, you know, be one thing, or but things that people should look out for, especially if it's their first time venturing into a, a nice, an asset purchase that they, you know, may not know as much about. I know it's always good to start with what you know and invest in what you know, but there is that idea of diversifying as well. So I, you know, I, for myself, I'm not the most real estate savvy person, but I would, if I decided to learn about it, what are some things I should look out for if I was going into purchasing my first home in an IRA or something? 
Yeah, absolutely. So when it comes to real estate, the big thing with people nowadays is they want to rent. It's a very rent based economy where we want to go in. We don't have any liability. We don't own anything. So we just pay somebody a set amount of rent every month to live in a property or, or what it, whatever it is, whether it be for your business and you're renting out a commercial property. The big thing with real estate is equity. You can apply it to a number of different things in life, but when you're purchasing a property, whether it be through a mortgage or if you're buying cash or if you're using your IRA, you're gaining equity in that building. So you're actually working to own that property rather than just throwing money away to, you know, to, to remove yourself from any liability. So the big thing is I would always suggest go out and purchasing it, purchasing a property, gain equity, and you can leverage that equity because that's, you know, your, your assets. That's another asset of yours that you get to, to add to your list of, you know, different assets, car, house, you can leverage those things. My suggestion or something I learned when I was taking my real estate class and something I'm trying to implement now is you find a duplex, which is a two unit home. And you want to live in one of those duplexes and rent out the other half. And basically the other tenant is paying your mortgage payment because you set out rent for them and you already have this mortgage. So rather than paying rent and not gaining any equity, Mm -hmm. You're having you're renting out to somebody else who's not gaining any equity, but they're actually paying for you to gain equity. And the great thing about that is for young people, if you're a first time home buyer, there's this beautiful thing called an FHA loan where interest rates are at a cap level. And um, Mm -hmm. there are a lot of different ways that you can leverage an FHA loan. And there are a lot of different benefits to that rather than, you know, your traditional your traditional loan or mortgage. So you can actually use that to buy the duplex. And as I said earlier, you can even take money out of your Roth to purchase that duplex or you take money out of your Roth's earnings so you can go out and purchase that duplex because you're a first time home buyer. But some, another thing I learned in my real estate training is everybody thinks their house is the Taj Mahal. So we can't tell people what to sell their property for it's we we only advise people and they get to tell us what they want to list their property as so whenever you're going out and you're looking at different properties there's going to be a lot of properties that are valued a lot more than they should be so you need to learn how to bargain with people you need to learn how to negotiate with people and know what the actual property is worth so a good way of doing that is doing a bunch of comparisons on Zillow or whatever it may be and seeing what houses in the area are worth or what houses that have recently sold in the area have sold for and then compare it to the building that you're looking mm-hmm. at and what they're selling it for. You know, So if it's a two-car garage and something with a one-car garage sold for way less, then you have to <laughs> negotiate, hey, why am I paying so much more for this when there's only one additional spot for a mm-hmm. car. Like you have to look at the different values. There are lif- a lot of different things that determine value. And a lot of people think that, you know, at a pool, that's going to make my house right. a lot more valuable. <laughs> that has actually shown to decrease value over time because not everybody wants a pool. Some people, the maintenance on a pool, exactly. like you want a pool for three months of the year, but you don't want a pool <laughs> in Pennsylvania in January. Exactly. You have a 70 year old potential buyer. They don't want to deal with that or. You know, right do all that maintenance or they might not even swim anymore. So you just lost out on a potential buyer because you wanted to have a pool for three months out of the year. So there are a lot of different things. So whatever it is that you want to get your, you know, dip your toes into, whether it be lending, real estate, private placements, we're lucky enough to have, you know, wealth of knowledge available all over the place, whether it be Google, whether it be YouTube, whether it be camaplan.com and the recorded webinars we do there, whether it be this podcast, just, go around, there's going to be people telling you things that aren't right. And there are going to be people that are telling you things that are spot on, but it may not be exactly right for you. You have to build your understanding, get your foundational truths or your, yeah, your foundational truths from all these different um, avenues and put them together for what works best for you. Great. Thanks. Well, and so just uh, correct me if I, you know, if I did miss anything in your explanation, the in terms of if, if, if someone wanted to self-direct their 
first time home purchase, but in an IRA, you know, obviously it's not their first time home. How does that work? And this is, this kind of ties into prohibited transactions and who's prohibited because I know a lot of people run into the issue of like, They want to own a beach house in their IRA, but they can't visit the beach house over the summer, that sort of thing. So because they're the prohibited person or whoever in their alineal or ascent or descent, their lineal descent or ascent or descent is also considered prohibited and they can't visit the shore house. So can you talk a little bit more about prohibited transactions and prohibited persons in an IRA and what's allowed, what's not, even in your duplex example, like would you be allowed to purchase the duplex in the IRA if you were living in half of it and another tenant was paying you rental income? Great question. So I guess, you know, the foundational truth in this or what I gathered and what helps me learn self-directed investing and all that good stuff is you're putting your money into these tax sheltered accounts. Why is the IRS letting you do this? It's because you're adding money into the market. You're, you know, that money is not just sitting somewhere where it's not, you know, benefiting small businesses or different companies or, or generating tax income for the government. So you're not paying taxes on this, on this money. So they want you to pay somebody who's going to pay the taxes. They want to get their taxes somehow. So Mm -hmm. the big thing is you're not supposed to be able to receive or provide a direct benefit to any of these investments. These are supposed to be hands-off investments or arm's length transactions, whatever you want to call it. So there's no self-dealing or sweat equity. And again, you can't receive or provide a direct benefit to any of these investments inside of your IRA. And what that means is, for example, if you wanted to purchase a property in in your IRA, you could go out and purchase the property in the IRA, but you couldn't stay in it because that's receiving a benefit. Anybody of lineal ascent or descent from you, so grandparents, parents, children, grandchildren, they would all be prohibited as well as any entity. And by entity, I mean different LLCs or companies that these people may own would be prohibited from the same thing, providing or receiving a direct benefit from the investment. Now that's lineal ascent or descent, but brothers, sisters, they're lateral, aunts and uncles, they're lateral. So they, they're not disqualified. But providing a benefit to the IRA would be, hey, I want to go out and purchase a property, but it needs in, it needs the, the walls need to be painted. So I'm going to go in there and paint it myself. No, because you're providing a benefit. You're not paying somebody right. else who would paint that building at a competitive rate, and then they would have to pay taxes on that income. So again, you're providing a benefit to the IRA. And this isn't just for self-directed IRAs. This goes for any IRA anywhere. Mm-hmm. So that's why when you open your Schwab account or your Fidelity or TD Ameritrade account, one of the first things that they ask you is, hey, is any direct relative of lineal ascent or descent from you, are they managing members or owners of any publicly traded companies? Because that could create a conflict of interest and a prohibited transaction. So it's not mm-hmm. just us. It's it's everybody. It's everybody's IRA. So, right. You want to do if in the example of the two bedroom or the two unit apartment, the duplex, you would purchase that property in the IRA. Your IRA would pay for any renovations or for the walls to be painted, and then the tenants would pay the IRA the rental income directly. And that way, you're not really you're very limited to the interaction into the investment, and it's very hands off. And you wouldn't be staying in there personally, unfortunately. Right. So in the example of the duplex, then you would be, if you wanted to purchase it, to live in it and have someone paying rental income to you is sort of like a passive income avenue. In addition to having an IRA, you could do that, but you would be able to, you would have to, in order to do that, that would have to be a distribution from your IRA and used as personal money versus, you know, month as a payment in the IRA or a purchase in the IRA, I mean, and then you go live in it. So do I have that? Does that, do I have that correct based on what you're saying? Correct. So, um, okay. you can take money out of your, you can take earnings out of your Roth IRA for first time home purchases. So when you contribute to a Roth IRA, the money that you earn inside of that Roth has to stay in there until you retire. But there are exemptions for things like this. Right. So you would have, you could take that, those earnings personally for this purchase. And then that would, that would be the exemption. So you could actually take out your earnings. Great. All right. Well, thank you. And thanks for, you know, breaking that down and contextualizing it. So 
let's just say, you know, someone through a gray area, misunderstanding, didn't do all their homework, does engage in a prohibited transaction in their IRA. What are the consequences of that? Or what are the short-term consequences? What are the long-term consequences? What happens to people's income in their IRA if they engage in one of these prohibited transactions and if it's reported on or if it's not reported on, just sometimes honestly, like through like an honest mistake, you know, nobody's intentionally trying to commit this prohibited transaction, but it happens. What happens to the person's standing, I guess, with their IRA and with the IRS? Gotcha. So the big thing is the IRS isn't following around with drones, at least not yet, or at least not that I know of. But, so <laughs> if you do something like that, assuming it's in an IRA owned property, and you, d- you try to do a prohibited transaction, they're not, unless they audit you, they're not going to really know until they look into it. So the main way people get caught is they have family, friends, or neighbors, or somebody that they have a falling out with that knows they're doing these prohibited transactions, and then they report them and all that stuff. But mm. you did it by accident, and whoops, I, I need to, to fix it. So for in the example of hey, uh, my oil, the oil heater broke in the uh, in the apartment that's owned by the IRA and I needed to pay for it out of pocket because it's the middle of the winter and the tenant needs to be warm and all that. So I paid it personally. The best thing to do in that situation is get your money back, have somebody who's not disqualified pay for it. So either the tenant themselves mm-hmm. or sister, brother, friend, aunt, uncle, somebody who's not disqualified, have them pay that expense. And then what you can do is you can reimburse those people for the money they spent directly out of the IRA to make it not prohibited. But the big thing is don't commingle personal money and assets with your IRA's money and assets. So try to keep them separate at all times and it'll make things a lot easier. Great. Thanks. So you touch on, you know, with real estate, there is a lot of, even if you're relatively hands-off with it being in a self-directed IRA account. You can't do any of the sweat equity yourself. You can't have any prohibited person do any part of the sweat equity. But you are hiring contractors. You are keeping track of rental income going into your IRA. It's a pretty active investment. And obviously with self-directed, that is an adjective. Like you said, it does describe that there is an accountability on the self. But are there, and I think like you've gone into detail with private placements and private lending and things like that. Are there things since investment is also an investment of your, you know, your, your time income as much as it is your financial income? Are there types of investments for people who may be starting out using a self-directed IRA as additional income? They don't want to quit their nine to five job just yet, but they want to get their toes wet. Is there anything that you would say is probably better for folks who don't have the time to commit to some of those more active investments, even though it is all self-directed. Yeah, absolutely. So lending money is very passive. All you do is basically come to the agreement. You guys sign the documents and you send them into Cama plan. And then we release the funds to your borrower. And then you can see that asset inside of your account as a note that you're invested in. And then all your borrower has to do is send the payments directly into us. And you don't really have to do anything after that. But private placements are another good thing. You invest into a fund. They do whatever they need to do with that money to earn your interest. And then you get interest and dividend payments back. There are a number of different hands-off things. And even with real estate, you can pay uh, Mm -hmm. a property manager out of your IRA to manage a property as long as they're not a disqualified person and take all the hands-off stuff out of it. But obviously, you want to take into account what your projected earnings are and you want to balance exactly how much your expenses and your earnings are going to be to make it as profitable as possible. But there are a number of different ways right, exactly. to take your mm-hmm. your time out of it. Great. Thanks, Will. And I listen, I'm I love the word passive in every sense of the word. I am I have to force myself to get on a treadmill every day. So for me, <laughs> knowing that it's still an option to still be able to grow my wealth, but also uh, since I'm not the most financially savvy person just yet to have, you know, a sense of I can still be growing my money in a way that I can keep track of. I can check in on, know what my money is doing, but also I'm not the one 
doing all the math because I failed math all the time. So <laughs> I think that's, I think it's helpful to know that, you know, you can have a team of financial professionals, even at a young age and to be able to lean on them with, with certain things and rely on other strengths as well as your own. So a couple of other questions I do have as we round the end of this is how do you say, you know, 50 years from now, I'm 75 It's time to retire. I've been taking distributions, required minimum distributions from my IRA. How does it work with closing a self-directed IRA down? Is it just you you distribute it until it's gone? Like, how does that work? So that's a big financial planning thing. You can, Mm -hmm. again, with Roth IRAs, you can keep it open as long as you want. And then if you're past retirement age, if you own properties, rental properties in that Roth IRA, all the earnings are tax-free past a certain point when you're ready to retire. So you can actually, once those rental checks are sent to the IRA, you can have them sent directly to you tax-free. But if you wanted to close out the entire account, you would just sell the investment, whether it be a property, whether it be the shares of that privately traded company. If you want to close out that note, your borrower will pay you know whatever you do and you'll satisfy that note and then you'll have cash. So basically what you want to do is how long do you expect to be retired for? Like how, like if you're 50, obviously we, we want to all live to 100 or, or whatever it may be. So you want to know that mm-hmm. when you take this money out, what are your monthly expenses going to be? How much can you take out and how long will that money last? Otherwise, just keep investing it and, you know, have that money go back to you. I would never personally, I never plan on closing out my IRA. Because even when I'm done with it, you have beneficiaries. And when I pass, it'll be passed on to my, you know, sisters or it'll go to my nieces and nephews. But whatever you can do to grow that money in that tax advantage plan, I would keep mine open forever. Right. And I think we've talked, I've talked about this before with others on this podcast is the idea of you're building a financial legacy. And I think you touch on that as well with beneficiaries. And part of the reason why it's great to start young is that you start building that legacy for your future children and grandchildren already now when, you know, I'm still so far out from thinking of being a parent. But (laughs) the idea that I can set my kids up now because I feel like college, same thing as you said about taxes, I feel like college prices and tuition prices are only going to go up. So I think that it's a great idea to start planning ahead and do whatever you can to start planning ahead. The other question I have is more on your experience with educating clients and prospective clients throughout the years at Cama Plan. What are some of, did I miss any other questions or is there any common questions that you get a lot of that you want to touch on now that you think people should start considering if they're considering this investment option? Uh, yeah, I get a lot of questions every day about different things people are trying to do. But the, the biggest thing that you're not technically allowed to do that everybody wants to do when they come in is, hey, I, I found this beautiful property. I want to live in it. I'm going to use my personal funds to purchase it, but I need money for the down payment. So I'm going to use my IRA. Unfortunately, that would be disqualified. You can partner your IRA with you as long as you're following the rules 100%. That means you wouldn't be able to stay in that property, but you could combine money at a percentage basis and pay expenses at that percentage and earn return or earn a return from that investment at that percentage. But If your IRA is going to be involved in the investment, it has to be involved from the beginning and it has to be involved either at a percentage basis or full out or else you could fall into the risk of it becoming a prohibited transaction. So beauty of the self-directed IRA is you're getting to earn rates higher than you would on the stock market with using the knowledge that you know personally, but you just have to leverage or you have to weigh that against I'm not going to be able to benefit from it. And that's you're already receiving a huge benefit by growing the IRA at the rates you are. So use that money for something that's going to grow the IRA. Don't try to use it personally because you're taking away from your future. Right. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, I think that pretty much covers it and breaks it down to its simplest form. So thanks again, Will, for going over these questions with us, for sharing your personal stories and for sharing you know, some of the anecdotes that you've gotten over the years. And I really think this is going to help a lot of listeners, especially younger people or 
people who may be interested in starting self-direction, but just needed some help understanding how to u- use this particular tool in their investment toolbox. So the last question I do have before we sign off is how can people reach you if they have some more questions? Where can people go to learn more about these questions that they may have or about self-direction? Yeah, I'm very reachable. You can either call our office at 215-283-2868 and just ask for Will, or you can email me at my direct email at wmucker, which is the M as in Michael, U-C-K-E-R, at camoplan.com. You can always go on our website. We have a wealth of information under recorded webinars and different articles that you can find on our website that will help increase your knowledge and expand your knowledge of the things that you may want to get into with your IRA. Different websites, the internet is our biggest biggest asset nowadays. So you have Google, you have YouTube, you have like Investopedia and, and all of that stuff to educate yourself. We have different investment groups like... Um, organizations we like to go around to and and teach the exact things we're talking about today to everybody who attends. We like to, our big thing is education and customer service. So whether it be directly through us or we're your third party on this information gathering, just reach out to us or go to our website. We'd be happy to help. Thanks, Will. I have the luxury of getting to just, when we were in the office, to just tap the wall next to me and ask Will these questions, but reach out to him uh, if you ever need anything. I'd be like, Will, it wouldn't even be financial questions. I'd ask him to come to karaoke parties at my house, but (laughs) that's that's beside the point. Well, Will, thank you again. Thanks again. Uh, This is going to be really helpful. For those of you who are listening, tune in next week to hear more from experts who have paved their roads to financial freedom. Or you can call Plan today to learn more about how you can start to take control of your future wealth. Thanks, everyone. 